I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm talking with Tyshawn Wardlaw, the director of the documentary Growing Up Milwaukee, which is currently streaming on HBO Max. It showcases three young people who are hoping to find purpose and make something of themselves in the Wisconsin city. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask you, Tyshawn, is uh, uh, how did you end up connecting with these three people? Um, well, I actually found them as soon as we started uh, production. Um, but prior to production, my main purpose of creating the documentary was to uh, go behind some of the statistics, unfortunately, which are coming out of uh, the Black community in Milwaukee. Um, unfortunately, Milwaukee is ranked as one of the worst uh, cities, unfortunately, for Blacks to live and grow up in. Um, we have high st uh, statistics with um, incarceration of Black and Brown men, um, as well as econ um, economic disparities, education, and kind of the list goes on. Um, so when I set out to be able to tell the stories behind the statistics, I wanted to focus on um, the stories from a youth perspective. And then also, um, when I decided that um, I was going to do youth, I approached youth-based organizations um, to check and see if they knew of any youth that would uh, basically kind of fit in some of those statistics, unfortunately, so that we could uh, be able to see and experience uh, what some of the youth in the city is dealing with day in and day out. Were any of the uh, uh, subjects, uh, Marquel, Tiana, or Brandon, uh, skeptical about being a part of this? I think just anybody just kind of sharing their truths. Uh, but I think I was also very transparent and honest with, with them um, from the beginning that, you know, I wanted to take an observational approach. So I wanted to turn the cameras on um, and be able to film your unedited truth, whether that was the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I did not want to filter it out, um, you know, and whatever you were going through in that moment and was ready to let us in, then we would be there, um, you know, to be able to film it. Um, so I think I was able to gain their trust, uh, you know, even before filming, but being very honest with them, um, you know, that I didn't know exactly how the film was going to turn out. I didn't know exactly where the film would go, um, but I knew that their stories were important. And I knew that um, eventually whatever happened while we were filming, that it could be life-changing for everyone. Uh, how long uh, over, uh, did, were you filming them and over, uh, and over like what, what uh, dates were you film were, were you filming them? So we started filming production in 2018, and we did uh, a very uh, aggressive edit and wrap, literally like going into 2020. So we uh, filmed from 2018 until the, almost the beginning of 2020, and then I was able to turn the, the edit around fairly quickly. So we filmed for about two years. So were, um, were there any parts of their stories um, uh, that you had wanted to include in the final cut, but for whatever reason, uh, you weren't able to make that work in that final cut of the movie that you put out? Um, actually, there was there was a few because, um, and, and for instance, with Marquell, um, we focused a lot in on um, his story uh, at school um, with other students. Um, and we were also able to uh, gain some of those truths from a, a group of students besides the ones that I was able to uh, include in the film. And I felt that their stories was also important. But if it was a series, it would have been phenomenal um, to have all of that footage. But um, unfortunately, for the sake of time, and it's already, you know, a very strong feature with uh, being two hours. So um, there were moments, uh, even with other people that we were introduced to uh, from the featured youth that I wanted to include. But unfortunately, I just didn't have time. And Marquel was the uh, he was the uh, uh, the student who was uh, doing the writing and sharing his writing, right? Correct, correct. So we see him uh, when the documentary opens in the classroom, um, in the classroom setting, and then that's where we're introduced with him um, when he was actually writing and sharing his truths in that uh, truth session. Was was that his first time uh, uh, sharing his writing with other uh, with with his peers? Well, interestingly, um, I'm not for sure if that was the first writing assignment, but I know um, that they did have a, 
safe space in one of their classes, which we filmed uh, the actual next year um, when he was a junior, that they created this safe space where they can talk and, and bring all of whatever was happening in their lives. But I think that might have been the first time that he probably shared it in a writing format, but I'm not for certain. But um, I think that was probably, you know, probably it is raw as moment when, when he did that, when we were able to capture that. Yeah, I was I was wondering that because it felt such, like such an organic moment that mm -hmm. you were capturing, and um, I was wondering if you had uh, if that was your first time capturing him in that class, or if you had done, or if you had uh, uh, followed him a bit more before that, because he seemed uh, he seemed like right at that level where he was still nervous, but you know he was but he was willing to do it, but it seems like it might have taken him a couple of uh, go rounds there to actually get up that courage to do it. And actually, that was the very first time that we filmed with him. That was the very first time. So we didn't have any pre-prep or anything like that. The cameras was there. Um, and, and that's actually where we met him, in that classroom. So uh, that was his unedited truth at that moment. So I'm, I'm glad that he was so transparent. Um, and even with, uh, that's the first moment that we even share with him crying or, you know, actually, you know, physically showing the emotions of sadness and uh, the way that he felt in his writing. So that was our very first time filming with him. So have you kept, uh, uh, now you said you wrapped up like right around the beginning of 2020. So, you know, before time stopped and everything mm -hmm. changed. Uh, <laughs> um, have you uh, uh, spoken or kept in contact with the subjects uh, since, uh, uh, since you completed the filming? Yes. So actually all three um, I've been in contact with, you know, and especially when when the entire world stopped, you know, I wanted to make sure that they were safe and, um, you know, quarantining and um, all of that things and how were their families. So we stay in contact with each other. And also, I just kind of want to know what they're doing um, in their day to day lives, because that was one thing that I was very keen on that, um, you know, even after the cameras were rolling I want it to be able to still be a, an, ass, an asset to them. I still want to be a resource. Um, and they know that I'm available as far as, and even some of the, the individuals that we film with, the community um, organizers and leaders are also in their lives as well. So I stay in contact with them very frequently. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, uh, uh, you know, time stopped and everything at the beginning of 2020. And then it feels like, and then uh, later in the year, it felt like it did it again when uh, after the, uh, horrific murder of George Floyd, and um, it, it felt like there was a real reckoning going on. And then it hit Wisconsin, uh, mm -hmm. also with the uh, with the one two punch of the the uh, uh, shooting of Jacob Blake, and mm -hmm. then the uh, and then the situation with uh, uh, the kid from Illinois who uh, went into I know it's not Milwaukee but Kenosha, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, have you talked to them about uh, everything that's gone on over now almost a year uh, over the past year on that front? And what are their and if you have, what are their thoughts on everything that's been going on since? Well, interestingly, actually, Marquel has become quite the activist uh, because now, like even as you said, like you seem like he was warming up on cameras, but now if you get a camera in front of him or whatever, he's out in the street. He was even protesting um, after uh, the 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 gentleman got shot in uh, the city in Wisconsin. He was out there with his mask on, uh, protesting as well. So um, on the activism side, like Marquel has been the most uh, person who has really stood up and said, you know what, we can't tolerate this. Um, you know, we have to, you know, do something not only to change the story that's being created about us, but also just our safety, not only, you know, just preserving the lives within the Black community, but also how um, it's, it's created within, you know, law enforcement and how we're treated. So he is very vocal, um, you know, on that end. And then as far as the other two individuals, we quite haven't really spoke about that aspect because I think just their, everything that they were going through within their day-to-day -day lives, I don't think they've had the opportunity to really kind of key in and um, see like how they could be a part of that. But I would say Marquel for sure um, has really vocal um, his opinion on what was happening as well as getting out to uh, protest as well. So uh, one of the things I'm also curious about is, um, uh, and I don't know how much you, you, you may know about this, this is a bit, a bit tangential, but uh, mm -hmm. do you feel that the city of Milwaukee and the state of Wisconsin are at least trying to do their part in helping to fund some of these programs that we see 
uh, are, that are really well, uh, well run and effective programs uh, for these young people it, uh, that, that, that the young people utilize in this documentary. Have they been, have, have, have they been doing, do you feel like they've been doing their fair share to try to help uh, do what they can for these programs? Well, I could say that I think it's getting better um, because once again, I think across the board in the United States, sometimes art programs and different things, unfortunately, are the first to go. Um, you know, even with that city budget, state budgets, um, you know, they get the grunt, unfortunately, of some of the budget cuts. Um, and I can definitely say that we've seen that in Milwaukee, but some of those youth based organizations, even fun, um, prime example of uh, Flood the Hood with Dreams, which is uh, Muhib Dyer and uh, Pramanan Nixon uh, funded that uh, um, several years ago. They actually help fund some of that themselves. Um, so they don't wait on like, because uh, I think they're for profit. So I don't believe that they're nonprofit. So for grants or anything else like that, they actually get out there, um, even if they don't have contracts to be able to link up with schools and, and different programs so that they could get the word out and encourage the young men. So I would say that um, we definitely, you know, Milwaukee has to do better. Uh, Wisconsin even has to do better um, with being able to provide. Um, Pro, not programming, but programming and funding, because sometimes I think if you're for profit, you kind of get cut in the shuffle because, you know, you don't get the grant money or you don't qualify or you don't um, qualify even through a fiscal agent to be able to get those funds. So I would say that um, they definitely can do a lot better on that in um, being able to make sure that those youth based organizations, whether for profit or nonprofit, are being able to fund those programs that are, are desperately needed in the communities. And uh, to circle back, it's uh, kind of to where I started. I should have asked this at the beginning, so I apologize for the out of order of how out of order everything is. But um, uh, uh, how did you settle on Mil on on doing this about Milwaukee? Do you have a personal connection to Milwaukee, or was it really the statistics that drove your decision to to uh, center it there? Yes. So my personal connection is I'm a Milwaukee native. So I was born in Milwaukee, raised in Milwaukee. Um, however, I left. So I always like to say that I'm a self proclaimed floater uh, because I floated between states um, for jobs in the entertainment industry. So um, right out of high school, I left to attend college at. Santa Clara University in California. Um, and then I moved back to the Midwest uh, to get a job in Chicago. And then I uh, actually made a detour in the news industry and worked for an ABC affiliate and a CBS affiliate. And then I got out of news, went to talk show world. And then I floated around uh, again, moved back out to California, moved back to Chicago. So between all that floating, uh, Milwaukee was still home, whether I was here for a short period of time or just visiting my family or home um, in between contracts. Um, but I noticed that there was a, a shift on what was happening um, and what was being said um, on the, the local news and national news um, about uh, the city and, and, and in the Black community. So when I decided uh, about six years ago that I wanted to create my own content, I wasn't going to wait on any more contracts. And, and as awesome as it was to work for some of the organizations that um, in the industry that I worked for, um, I was ready to launch out and you know start my entrepreneurship career. So then that's when my decision desire to tell the stories about what was happening in Milwaukee um, really started to develop. Well, Tashawn, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we wish you all the best over this upcoming Emmy season. And uh, to all of our viewers, please like this video, smash that subscribe button, and don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions and see if you can outsmart the top prognosticators in Hollywood. Thanks again, Tashawn. Thank you for having me.